All right, we are going to go ahead and get started. Uh, this is Robert Haynes here at the National Weather Service in Burlington, and I have Matthew Clay with me, who is our uh, severe team leader here at the National Weather Service in Burlington. Thanks, and we appreciate your attendance here and your interest in the uh, Skywarn Spotter program. Uh, so we will go ahead and get started. Uh, just as a quick reminder, uh, if you do not have a microphone uh, through your computer, uh, if you want to ask any questions, uh, you'll need to go through a phone audio. If you pull down the chat menu on the on the right hand side uh, in the GoToWebinar menu, uh, it'll give you instructions on how you can get uh, that unique audio pin that you can sign in for your phone. As we go throughout the presentation, you'll see on the top right uh, will be slide numbers. Uh, with that, you can write those down uh, so that you can go back uh, and ask any questions related to those slides. Uh, we have various slides throughout the presentation uh, where we'll give you that opportunity to ask some questions. Uh, without further ado, we shall begin. So here's what we'll discuss today. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what Skywarn is uh, and what it means for us here in the National Weather Service. Uh, we'll give you a quick overview of the National Weather Service, how we operate here and how we kind of fall in the, the pecking order of NOAA. We'll then give a brief overview of thunderstorm science and forecasting, uh, and then give you a little bit of detail on how we collaborate with the Storm Prediction Center on how that kind of trickles down to our convective watches uh, and then our warnings and then our reports. We'll then look at the different types of thunderstorms that we can encounter uh, and each of the different type of convective warnings uh, that we can experience here. Uh, and then we'll just give a quick overview of safety and uh, reporting severe weather uh, as we wrap up the presentation. So what is Skywarn? Skywarn has its roots within amateur radio. Uh, the ability to communicate when phone lines are down is invaluable. And as a result, that's how we got our start here with Skywarn. It started in the 1960s. Uh, the, main, uh, the main thing is that uh, these people were trained by the National Weather Service uh, and reporting many different types of significant or severe weather to us. Uh, it gives us a network of ground truth uh, that helps us to verify warnings and give us vital information that we can then pass on in the messaging that we use uh, in our warnings. Anyone can become a spotter. Uh, it initially started with amateur radio operators, but uh, it has expanded to include many different people, including emergency managers and firefighters, first responders, uh, and the like, as well as media researchers and college students, as well as other people who are interested in storm chasing or just in the general public uh, for those hobbyists out there. How to become a spotter. Uh, there are no membership fees. This is something that's free. Uh, it's a volunteer service that you provide for us and it's something that you can do uh, for us at, uh, at your own uh, time and leisure. Uh, you can participate as much or as little as you like. Uh, the only thing is we ask that you be trained by a National Weather Service uh, employee, uh, whether that be through an in-person spotter talk or a virtual course like you're participating in today. Uh, and we also have a Comet Met Ed course uh, that you can look at online uh, and there you can go through some of that training as well. As always, we encourage you to contact the local National Weather Service that you're in. Uh, for those of us who are uh, joining in our area, you can always ask whether or not uh, you're in our forecast area. If not, uh, we can pass along that information uh, to the Weather Service office in your area. So upon completion, uh, this is again voluntary. Uh, we would just ask for your physical location and a number of uh, that we can easily reach you at. Uh, that way we can uh, contact you if we happen to notice a storm near your area, or you can always feel free to call us. And at the end of this uh, presentation, uh, we'll give you the information that you can use to, uh, we can, we'll give you the spotter line where you can directly call us. Uh, so why do we need spotters? Why, is, why are spotters important for us? Uh, this volunteer service is particularly important here in the North Country uh, because we have beam blockage from the mountains. As a result, uh, our lowest scans are not going to show much of anything east of the Greens or west of the Adirondacks over in New York. As a result, we don't often see the lowest scans 
uh, below 4,000 foot elevation or above ground level. As a result, sometimes we don't see things like funnel clouds or uh, downburst winds uh, or any of those kind of signatures uh, that we might be able to see uh, if we are not being blocked. And so what spotters can do is they can see what's happening near to the surface uh, where radar shows what's happening up above. From your reports, we can then incorporate that information uh, into, into the messaging for our warnings, uh, which could even be a potentially life-saving uh, a life-saving thing to do. With that, we'll transition quickly into what the National Weather Service is. Ultimately, our mission here at the National Weather Service is to provide weather, water, and climate data. Uh, through that, we kind of take all of this information, we analyze it, uh, and prepare forecasts and warnings uh, and with the goal and intent of preserving life and property. Uh, we are a part of the Department of Commerce, so we also have that little snippet of enhancing the national economy uh, through the forecast that we provide uh, and helping provide some of those uh, decision support services. Our vision is a weather-ready nation. Uh, that's part of what Skywarn is. Uh, it's helping to educate uh, and, and kind of pre pre present this information uh, to the general public. Uh, to help you respond to weather, uh, whether that be severe or on a sunny day. Uh, a lot of this goes to making sure that you're ready to take the actions needed in severe weather. Where do we fit within NOAA? We are a field office here in the National Weather Service. Uh, we have a pretty complex structure, uh, but we set under, uh, we're just a little field office uh, focused on our local area. Uh, we primarily just focus in on northern Vermont, uh, central Vermont, and far northern New York. And so we are just a branch of NOAA focusing on these northernmost counties here. Uh, we're staffed 24-7. Uh, more than just forecast, we also research the local climate of this area uh, to better understand it and serve this local area. We coordinate with volunteer observers through things like the co-op po program or COCO-RAS, uh, we also collaborate with academia on research uh, related to this local area here, all in an effort uh, to provide better forecasts for this region. Here's a little quick map summarizing some of the area of our responsibility, highlighting some of the different uh, terrain features here. Uh, we have a wide variety of terrain features here, uh, from hills and valleys uh, to forests here. Uh, we have a pretty complex set of topography across your area, uh, which plays a large part in our weather forecasts. Uh, it starts all the way from the St. Lawrence River uh, Valley, all the way to the Adirondacks, into the Champlain Valley, and then to the Green Mountains and east to the rest of Vermont, including portions of the Connecticut River Valley. Uh, we focus on all of these different areas and work our best to understand uh, the different terrain features and how uh, they impact this area. So before we jump into uh, the Storm Prediction Center information and uh, the general thunderstorm uh, science, are there any questions about Skywarn or the National Weather Service in general? All right, nothing heard. As always, you can feel free to jump in on the questions, uh, on the questions part of your tab. Uh, you can then ask questions there. I see a question from Jane. At some point, please talk about uh, what you have observed uh, climate change in our area. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, generally, the what we've observed in our climate is uh, a steady warming trend, especially following the 1980s. Uh, we've gotten at least a little bit warmer uh, as far as the, especially the the average temperature in terms of like the the mean and the if you take the mean like the the high temperature and the low temperature and combine those two uh, there's a, a steady increase uh, I, I can't remember the exact number of how much uh, at this point though and to kind of uh, this is Matthew by the way to kind of um, add on to what Robert's saying about the climate change um, next year we will be getting our climate normals 
uh, for, the, for the last decade. We do that um, every 10 years. So we'll have new climate records um, to work with next year. So we'll be able to get a much better idea of uh, the climate change um, once we're able to get those new normals next year. And it looks like we did get one more question wondering what's the difference between storm spotter and storm chasing? Are they the same? Um, for uh, storm spotting, um, you can do that from anywhere. You can do that from your house, from your friend's house. Um, you can be out in the waterfront drinking a beer. Um, anything you're doing is storm spotting. Storm chasing, I would say, is more in the act of getting in your car and trying to find a storm or follow a storm. So they're a little bit different. We don't exactly encourage storm chasing because um, that puts yourself and others potentially in harm's way. Uh, but storm spotting is, is very passive. You can just be sitting at home. You see, a, you hear a thunderstorm outside. You look out the window and you see a tree has fallen over. You call and you let us know, and we know that that storm is producing damaging winds. So they're a little bit different, um, and we are here talking more about the uh, spotting aspect versus actually going out there and chasing. I see a question here about uh, where Washington and Lamoille City. Uh, I think in that case we ran out of uh, different color schemes that we could put. Uh, this is mainly that's mainly the capital region of Vermont is what we kind of designate that region as. All right. Uh, with that, uh, thanks for the questions. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started on thunderstorm forecasting. All right, so at the very minimum, there's three things that we need to create, um, gather thunderstorms, three ingredients. The first being moisture. You know, if you look outside and you have high humidity, that's the moisture that we're looking for. You have atmospheric instability, so we get more unstable as we have warmer temperatures outside. Um, you'll, if you ever read any of our discussions or hear anything um, called CAPE or convective uh, allowable potential available potential energy, that is the instability that we're referring to and forcing mechanisms um, such as a cold front, a warm front, or even mountains can act as a, a forcing mechanism used to create thunderstorms. So we do have a variety of types of thunderstorms and different factors that can combine to make storms more or less organized. And generally the more organized a thunderstorm is, the greater the severe threat is with that thunderstorm. So here's a little graphic put together showing um, how the ingredients come together to produce thunderstorm activities. What you see here, the green arrows represent moisture. The blue, uh, the blue line with the triangles represents the cold front and the sun represents our daily heating. As we get moisture increasing, a lifting mechanism such as the front moving and heating, we, all those ingredients come together to kind of give us the potential for severe thunderstorms or just thunderstorms in general. So we're gonna talk a little bit now about the Storm Prediction Center and some of the products and services they provide and how we collaborate with them. So the Storm Prediction Center also is part of the National Weather Service. They are located in Norman, Oklahoma in the National Weather Center. And their mission is to maintain a high achieving staff using innovative science and technology to deliver timely and accurate watch warning products and information dealing with all tornadoes, severe thunderstorms, lightnings, even wildfires and winter weather. In the last couple of years, the Storm Prediction Center has taken up um, issuing discussions for winter weather products. Uh, some of you guys may be familiar with those, um, indicating where we're getting high snowfall rates. And we don't deal with it too much up here with wildfires, but they do a lot of fire forecasts out for the Southwest where we get a lot of fire activity. And the vision for the SVC is just to be a trusted source of, for the prediction of tornadoes and other high impact hazardous weather. And if you ever want to go see any of the Storm Prediction Center's products, that's available at www.spc.noaa.gov, and that's on the slide as well. So um, the Storm Prediction Center, um, they do a rigorous analysis. Um, the lead forecaster on shift every day does a hand analysis, which is pretty old school, but it's actually one of the best way of determining mesoscale boundaries that are lingering across um, any area, uh, which can be the source of lift that can initiate convection. Um, they also use upper air soundings. There's a um, 80 something offices around the US that do upper air launches um, every day at um, 12Z and 0Z. And they analyze this upper air data to um, understand how stable or unstable the environment is. And they do a lot of science and a lot of research within the Storm Prediction Center. So they use a deep scientific understanding to diagnose severe weather threats and also to fire weather threats. Um, these people are really geared towards severe weather and they understand it very, very well. 
So we were gonna we're gonna focus on thunderstorms and the five tier approach uh, to communicating the threat level for various hazards, and um, and how that varies as each day approaches. So the Storm Prediction Center has five categories, six if you want to include just general thunderstorms. Um, you'll hear you'll see this a lot when you're looking at the Storm Prediction Center products. Uh, basically, the higher the number, the brighter the color, the more uh, the higher the predictability of a potential severe other episode. So the light green just represents no severe thunderstorms, just general thunder. It just means we could have some thunderstorms in the afternoon, produce some some locally heavy rainfall, but nothing too uh, too exorbitant or anything like that. When you get to the when you get to the brighter green, um, you start getting more of the ice, what they call marginal, which is isolated severe thunderstorms possible. Which means well, we could have a few strong to possibly severe thunderstorms, but their coverage is going to be very uh, very isolated and not very um, very widespread. And then as you continue to work through slight, enhance, moderate, and eventually to high, it's basically the higher probabilities in order to um, that you're going to see to produce uh, severe weather. So, so when you get to the when you when you start getting to enhance, moderate, and high, those tend to be our more significant weather events across the United States. Um, I'm not going to read everything on here, but you can see the difference, um, the different what what each different category represents. So this is an example of one of the Storm Prediction Center outlooks. This is for April 27, 2011. Um, if you've been, if you paid attention to the weather in the early 2000s, you'll um, early 2010s, I should say, you will remember this event as being one of the most widespread tornado outbreaks to occur in probably even not even just recent history and um, on record right now. So if we go back real quick and look at the um, severe thunderstorm risk, you'll see the marginal, slight, enhanced, moderate, high. And now that you see that and superimposed upon a map. So you see how they have a very broad area where they're expecting general thunderstorms, and then they begin to narrow it down where they, they where the the confidence and the threat for severe weather is more likely. And you can see them picking on the Alabama, eastern Mississippi, and southern Tennessee as being the area where they're expecting the greatest chance and also the strongest severe weather. And not only do they take that outlook as a whole, they split it into three subdivisions. They focus on the tornado threat, your wind threat, and your hail threat. And um, each one of those has a slightly separate legend, which is gonna be displayed on their website below their image. So you'll be able to see what they're thinking, but you can see the threats for the day. It tells you, we're looking at a 45% chance of a tornado within 25 nautical miles of your location. Um, if you're in um, north, Northwestern Alabama there, 45% chance of hail and wind damage. And so by looking at this, we're not only able to see what the overall picture is, but the individual threats as well. That helps us as forecasters with the messaging, um, helping us focus on what we think is gonna be the primary hazard for the day. So the collaboration with um, SPC, we do it all the time for all of our severe events up here. Um, the first thing that happens is the Storm Prediction Center will issue a mesoscale discussion. Um, Mesoscale discussion is just a, hey, heads up, we're seeing conditions favorable for an event. Um, the image on here is from May 4th, 2018, which is um, my uh, my most significant event since I've been here. Once the mesoscale discussion has um, been issued, there'll be a coordination between the Storm Prediction Center and affected for, uh, forecast offices. So it'll be us, Buffalo, Gray, Albany, potentially, depending on where the severe threat is. And once we have this coordination call, if we determine a watch is needed, a watch will then be issued. So now we're gonna look at all three of those uh, and we're gonna discuss them a little bit more in the, um, detail here. So the mesoscale discussion focuses on severe thunderstorm potential over the next six hours, but the main focus is within the first three hours. This is a short-term product. It's letting us know how the environment is changing. Is it becoming more conducive, less conducive? Are we looking at more potential for tornadoes, for hail, for wind? This kind of information is conveyed to us. And inside these products, they issue a probability of a watch, which ranges from unlikely, which is 5 to 20 percent, to a watch needed soon, 95 percent. And these mesoscale discussions will precede any watch and will give a heads up to both the public who's watching this off their website and also to the forecasters on shift. And if you look to the right side of the slide, you'll see a, uh, a, the discussion from the May 4th event of 2018. Um, what the Storm Prediction Center was saying um, about our area and basically say watch issuance is likely over our area because we were very conducive for severe weather that day. So the coordination calls is the Storm Prediction Center will send a message through AWIPS, which is our computer system here where we do all of our forecasting. 
and they let us know, hey, we would like to hold a conference call. And so they'll call us, we'll talk to them. Um, this typically happens an hour or two before severe weather is expected, but sometimes when there's a lot of weather going on, there could be a, uh, uh, it could be uh, almost as things are beginning to pop or as beginning to form. And on this call, we'll talk with the storm prediction centers about hazard, the different hazards, the timing, and which counties we want to be included. So we, we coordinate with them, say, hey, we want these counties, or can you take these counties out? Because we want to make sure that um, we don't want to have too many counties in there if we don't think it's going to affect all the area. And once the storm, once this call is completed, the storm prediction center will send us some information through AWIPS, which will um, allow us to begin to issue the watch products here inside of our office. So once we uh, have issued the watch, taken all the data from the Storm Prediction Center, put that out to the public, you'll see this pop up in the Storm Prediction Center's website, which gives us a, a visual area of where the uh, watch has been issued for. And they continue to provide us uh, updated mesoscale discussions during the duration of the watch. They typically issue one to two mesoscale discussions per watch to let us know how the severe threats is continuing. So our coordination doesn't end once the watch is out. We continue to work with them throughout the duration of the event to try to provide the best forecast that we can to everyone. And one of the things they help us with is they give us advice on when it's okay to begin canceling, watch, canceling watches. We don't want to cancel a watch and then all of a sudden we start seeing storms refire in them. And that's where their mesoscale discussion, their meso-analysts help us decide uh, where the severe threats are. And by, by this relationship that we have with the Storm Prediction Center, it really allows us to provide the best warnings and messaging to our emergency managers, which help us fulfill our mission. And I'm gonna hand it back over to Robert to talk about severe thunderstorm watches. All right, so you've gotten a view now of uh, the Storm Prediction Center and uh, how we coordinate and collaborate with them in providing you these uh, watch and warning information. Uh, the Storm Prediction Center is your first place as a storm spotter uh, where you can understand whether or not you'll need to keep your eye on the sky. Uh, and oftentimes those will be the days where we uh, coordinate on social media uh, or sometimes even ask for reports from the general public on places like Facebook or Twitter. When, uh, just to quickly discuss some of the differences between a severe thunderstorm watch versus a tornado watch, uh, Sometimes it can be uh, it can seem a little nebulous on uh, why one has been uh, set as a, to a tornado watch versus why one has been has been set as a severe thunderstorm watch. Uh, the primary difference is uh, is your tornado threat uh, likely or unlikely? Uh, if there's any possibility uh, that the tornado threat could at least be moderate, uh, there's always going to be a tornado watch issued. Uh, but within that tornado watch, there may be a variety of other different hazards uh, that are kind of combined with that tornado watch. Uh, in the case of a severe thunderstorm watch, uh, the tornado threat is considered to be relatively low, uh, but that does not necessarily mean that other severe weather hazards uh, might not be significant, especially out in the plains uh, where these thunderstorms develop with a little bit of a, a drier mid-level environment, uh, say along West Texas where a dry line can set up. Uh, you can get uh, extreme winds that rival that of a tornado uh, and hail that can uh, produce damage, uh, like that recent photo that's uh, been circulating of the grapefruit-sized hail that's punctured through a house roof. Uh, so in any case, uh, the severe thunderstorm watch is uh, just as much uh, an opportunity to keep your eye on the sky as a tornado watch itself. When a watch is issued, that's to signify uh, that conditions are favorable for severe weather development over the coming hours. Uh, it's just a message to say, uh, stay alert, uh, that the conditions are favorable. They might not be happening right at that time and you might even have clear blue skies, uh, but the general thinking is that uh, over time, warnings will be necessary. When a warning is issued, that is your cue to take action. Uh, that's indicating that severe weather is imminent or ongoing in that area, uh, and that's your time to put your plan into action. As a way to, uh, as an analogy uh, for what that looks like, uh, one might consider all of these ingredients a cupcake watch. Uh, you have your vanilla, your powdered sugar, your butter, uh, and any kind of cream that you have, as well as your eggs all of the necessary ingredients to make your cupcake. Uh, the cupcake warning is when your uh, 
cupcake is just about done in the oven and ready to come out uh, for your eating enjoyment. To kind of summarize everything that we've discussed, uh, just to give you a timeline of these different severe weather products, oftentimes our local offices will issue something called the hazardous weather outlook. Uh, that's just a general means to communicate the threat for hazardous weather. At some point, we coordinate with the Storm Prediction Center, uh, especially if the risk for severe weather is at least level two or slight risk or higher. Uh, based on the calls and coordination that we have, uh, we work on issuing watches. Uh, if you're ever curious about whether or not we might issue a watch, sometimes it might be good to see what's happening over at the Storm Prediction Center page and see if they've issued any mesoscale prediction discussions. Uh, some of those can be high level. Uh, but they are a precursor to a watch. And after a watch, we're very likely to be issuing warnings. And if there are warnings issued, uh, that means that we are likely to hear reports from you. And that can be any way through uh, the phones or the uh, social media or even ham, ham radio operators uh, can also provide that. Uh, so this little timeline of events uh, can take place over the course of several days or even a week sometimes in high confidence scenarios of severe weather. Uh, but uh, you play that role in kind of the culmination of all of the efforts that we've made in forecasting and preparing for severe weather events. And this is what a local storm report uh, looks like. Uh, once you've issued the report to us, whether or not that be downed trees, power lines, or the size of hail, or a significant wind gust, uh, we go in and based on the location that you provide, uh, we go in and assign uh, that latitude and longitude point uh, and then store that information. And that's uh, that can be used for a variety of different purposes uh, that goes into research applications, uh, that collection of data can be even important in uh, small things like litigations. Um, so finding these things and reporting them uh, does a service far beyond acknowledging and helping us to message severe weather. And this is what it looks like when all of those reports are collected. Uh, this is uh, the example of the uh, strong wind event that occurred uh, May 4th of 2018. Uh, you can see the collection of wind reports there in blue, uh, and even a few hail reports and that one tornado report down in uh, Wyndham County. So you, this is what all of the culmination of your reports and uh, what, whatever we receive uh, maps out into something like this, uh, which has, which can be important and used for future research uh, and also helps us find hot spots for severe weather. So we've now talked about the uh, general thunderstorm science, the Storm Prediction Center, and uh, the timeline of events uh, that eventually leads to a report from a Skyward spotter. Uh, before we go on to the next segment on convective warnings, are there any questions? All right, so we got a question, um, actually two questions. Uh, what kind of thresholds do you look for when issuing a tornado watch versus severe thunderstorm watch? Um, and that's a really good question, Ben. Um, the big thing is we're looking at the probability of tornadoes, um, you know, because in a tornado watch, we're expecting wind hazards and hail hazards as well. And even in severe thunderstorm watches, we can be looking at tornado hazards. But when tornadoes are unlikely to occur, that's when we tend to uh, hedge towards um, a severe thunderstorm watch. But once we start seeing um, tornadoes being more favorable to occur, that's when we start leading towards a, a tornado watch. So it's really just the probabilities of there being a tornado within the watch area. Um, we, got, we got another question from Barrett here. Are severe weather events here more associated with typical synoptic scale setups or do they occur in the absence of large 
scale forcing, um, like those driven by mesoscale features. Um, I say we, we kind of get a bit of both here. We have, um, we have mountains up here, which act as a, a force, a, a, a lifting mechanism. So as air approaches, um, it rides up over the mountains and as that air cools and condenses in the clouds, if we have an unstable environment um, at mountaintop level, we'll start seeing um, thunderstorms develop and evolve. Um, so we kind of get a mismatch, but we also do get the um, synaptic scale events. Like when we had the May 4th event, we had a strong cold front um, pushing in throughout of Canada and that strong uh, frontal boundary was what really drove our convection that day, as well as a lot of instability. So we kind of get a bit of both. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, and I might add things like, so I mean, mountains and our lakes can support uh, the upward motion of thunderstorms, uh, but they can also support downward motion, uh, especially at this time of year, uh, east of the lakes are downwind mainly, uh, anything that tries to come across the lake will find relatively cooler temperatures. While we're in the 80s, the lake is still in the 60s, and that can sometimes end up uh, killing a thunderstorm before it makes it east into uh, Vermont. Uh, but sometimes we might be relatively cool and the lake could be relatively warm and it could then enhance it. Uh, so it can depend, but our wide, feet, our wide range of features from valleys and hills uh, certainly can set up their own mesoscale boundaries uh, outside of the large-scale forcing. A lot of times we'll also talk about uh, a lake breeze that will form uh, towards the New York side of Lake Champlain, uh, where a southeasterly wind will form uh, from cool air from the lake trying to intrude over towards uh, the warmer temperatures over uh, on land. And so as a result, that uh, creates a boundary where convergence can occur uh, and that makes a small scale area of convergence or that lifting mechanism uh, that can produce thunderstorms. A lot of times we'll see uh, a system come right off the Adirondacks and then cells quickly develop as soon as they start reaching Platts the Plattsburgh area. <laughs> Good question. And we did receive one more question um, um, from Mark asking about um, for ham radio operators, is there a specific frequency or repeater to use when reporting reports to us via ham radio? Um, the answer is yes, and uh, um, the answer is also going to be in a future slide. So <laughs> that's going to be coming up here towards the end when we get into the reporting specifics, Mark. So if you have any questions after that, let us know. All right, so moving onwards, we're going to talk a little bit about convective warnings, um, severe flash flood and tornadoes. So what is a severe thunderstorm? You know, it's a pretty generic term. A lot of There's a lot of criteria for severe thunderstorms. So um, one of the more common ones that you'll hear is one hail of one inch in diameter or larger. Um, looking at the chart on the right, um, by using different uh, objects that you likely have around your house um, or have access to, you can use these to help report hail sizes. And so when we say one inch in diameter, if you have a quarter in your pocket, that's, that's about one inch in diameter. So that's what we use for severe criteria here in the United States. But we also are curious about dime and penny reports, nickel reports, anything that's less than an inch, because it still lets us know that storms are producing hail. So if we start seeing a storm getting stronger while it's producing the sub-severe hail, it'll let us know that, hey, there could be um, growing hail in there. And um, it, it goes all the way up to softball, four and a half inches. I pray I never see that. And um, I've done a case study on events where they produce like hail over eight inches in diameter. So hail can get very large, um, but luckily here in the North Country, I think our largest is about two and a half. Like two, and three quarters. two and three quarters of an inch, about a baseball size, the largest hailstone we have on record, which is actually reported by one of our employees. Another thing that makes us a thunderstorm severe is a wind gust of 58 miles per hour or 50 knots or greater. And at 58 miles per hour, that's when we start seeing some pretty significant damage as we start seeing trees being broken, uh, power lines being down, trees on power lines. Uh, that's when we start seeing uh, widespread wind damage is when we see 58 mile an hour winds. And typically any type of wind damage can um, be indicative of uh, a severe thunderstorm. Although small twigs, small branches down is normally sub-severe, but when we start seeing trees being blown over, that's when we start getting to the severe range. And technically a tornado of any intensity also categorizes a storm as severe. And although lightning is a killer, um, but one of the more uh, deadly phenomenons, it is not as criteria severe for severe for uh, for a severe thunderstorm. So even though a storm could be producing a copious amount of lightning, 
Uh, we might we might have a severe thunderstorm warning or, on it, or you might just issue a special weather statement letting people know that there's a lot of lightning with the storm. And flash flooding um, is not a convective, is not going to be a severe thunderstorm warning. We have a flash flood warning for that, but flash flooding uh, makes areas, makes rivers of areas that shouldn't rise, rise. So basically you start seeing rivers form in roads, um, you start seeing houses begin to flood away from rivers, um, and that happens over a very short period of time, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more in just a little bit. And here's some of the wind speed estimates. We were talking about the winds earlier. Um, when you start getting to the 25 to 30 mile an hour range, you can see some, some large branches broken. But once you start getting into the 55 to 72 mile an hour range, where we start getting into that low end severe, um, that's when we start seeing damage to chimneys, TV antennas, and maybe some shallow rooted trees begin, trees get, begin to become uprooted. And then once you start getting above 70 miles per hour, that's when we start looking at some pretty significant damage to both structures and also to um, nature. So a severe thunderstorm warning, um, as we talked about already, we um, expect hail that is one inch in diameter, which is about the size of a quarter or greater, um, wind gusts of 58 miles per hour or greater, or a tornado. Um, so when we issue a warning on social media, you'll whenever we issue a warning on Twitter, we'll have a graphic that immediately goes over to Twitter, and we, then we'll copy it over to Facebook right now, letting you know the hazards. And on the left side of the image, you'll be able to see what the hazards are. We're expecting winds up to 60 miles per hour and penny-sized hail. So this severe thunderstorm warning issued on June 18, 2018 was more so just for the wind as we were expecting sub-severe hail. Uh, flash flood warning, as we were talking about just not, not too long ago, um, indicates that a rapid rise in water has led to or will lead to flooding over the warned area. So just because you've issued a flash flood warning and you're like, oh, well, it's not flooding at my house, it doesn't necessarily mean it's flooding yet, but it means it, that we are expecting um, increases of water to for, um, water over roadways that could approach houses and begin to damage and um, you know flood your house. So these, um, these are something that we issue, except not as frequently as I would say severe thunderstorm warnings, but these tend to be the more impactful warnings here across the North Country. Um, so when you think of a flash flood warning, you can just think of a sudden violent rise of water following a heavy rainfall. The rainfall could have actually tapered off. Um, and the water that run, and since we have all this topography around, the water that begins to run off the mountains um, at a higher elevation could begin to flood lower lying areas. So even after rainfall ends, the flooding could still occur. So that's something that um, we have to pay attention to um, with the topography around our area. And we have this slogan, um, turn around, don't drown. And we mean it. Uh, more fatalities are caused by flooding from people trying to drive through flooding um, and other flooding related hazards than all of our severe hazards combined. So uh, you think about tornadoes, think about severe weather, you think about lightning, but you're not, those don't produce nearly as many deaths as flooding combined. So we are, we try to emphasize if a road is barricaded, if the, if you can't, if you, if the water's so deep you can't see the bottom, it is not smart to drive through that water. And tornado warnings um, are very rare across the North Country um, and are, you know, across northern New York here, um, as we don't tend to get supercells, which are our big drivers or tornadoes very often around here. The image that you see on the left is the last tornado warning that was issued by our office, and this was back in May 27th of 2014. So it's been over seven years now, or about six years, my apologies, since we've issued a tornado warning. And so a tornado is defined as a strong rotating column of air. And damage can vary anywhere from tree damage, um, which is EF0, which is very similar to like the 70 to 90 mile an hour wind damage, to catastrophic building damage, where you can see entire brick buildings completely leveled. And the strongest tornado to ever occur in Vermont was an EF2 tornado. And this has actually happened multiple times. Um, typically, the two that I could think of off the top of my head were both in Wyndham County, um, which is southeastern Vermont, which is actually an Albany's area of responsibility. Um, so I want to share with you guys a story. Uh, before I came to um, work in Burlington here, I worked in Little Rock, Arkansas for three years before moving to Anchorage for five and then eventually ending up here. Um, this was one of the more fun days um, of my experience in Little Rock. Um, you see that big circle where it says KLZK? Well, that's where we were. And um, we had this uh, strong convective system, which we're going to talk about more in detail later, uh, pass off just to the south of the office. And you'll see I've indicated where we had three separate tornadoes that were currently on the ground at the same time. So what we had to do, uh, we had to call Memphis, um, our, the forecast office to our east, um, let them know that we were evacuating our office to our storm shelter because there was a tornado well within five, five miles of our office. 
And so as we head out to um, our storm shelter, I try to grab a piece of hail because it was hailing outside. Lead forecaster grabs me by my belt buckle and says, there's no way in hell you're going outside. So I didn't go outside. But as we got into the shelter, shut the door, batten the hatches, all of our ears simultaneously popped. The mesocyclone, this, the tornado, the wall cloud itself moved right overhead. And less than five miles away from the office, an EF2 tornado uh, touched down near Jacksonville. And you can see that's just northeast of the radar there. So our office was missed by just about a little less than five miles. But we all had the wall cloud move right overhead because we had the pressure drop right over the office. So that was a pretty, uh, pretty somber, pretty interesting event, um, especially I was only a year into my weather service career when this happened. So this was uh, definitely one of the more fun events. And having three simultaneous tornadoes on the ground is a pretty awesome, uh, pretty awesome and pretty rare feature here. We'll quickly go over my story here. Uh, this is the only time that I've ever gotten off of school for flooding. Uh, I'm originally from the Atlanta, Georgia area. And uh, on this particular day in September 20th and the 21st, uh, we had a, several rounds of thunderstorms. It was near constant for 18 to 24 hours. Uh, the only time I've ever gotten off of school for flooding uh, because many areas received uh, well over seven inches of rain. Uh, I have a picture here courtesy of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, uh, which shows the Great American Scream Machine uh, partially submerged. Uh, and that's a part of the Six Flags uh, over Georgia Park, uh, which was right in that area of uh, those deep yellow colors uh, where estimated 15 to 16 inches of rain fell. A particularly uh, interesting event, there was so much rain, uh, parts of the Chattahoochee River uh, nearly came over the interstate bridges, uh, which would have effectively cut off much of northwest Georgia away from the city. Uh, a particularly uh, powerful flood event for our area uh, in one of the uh, highest rainfall amounts just in a single day all very localized as you can see uh, mainly focused around the perimeter of the city and not really anywhere else uh, that can sometimes be the nature of these convective events in the summer and i do see a note uh, that today is the anniversary of the 1953 ef4 in uh, worcester massachusetts uh, time permitting at the end of the presentation uh, we'll also go into uh, we'll allow we'll open it up uh, for anyone that wants to tell stories of uh, any events that they have experienced. For now, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the storm types or the convective modes. Uh, through our stories, you've gotten to see a little bit of a sample of something like a squall line, and in my case, uh, was more of a multi-cell case. So there are four different types of uh, convective modes that we generally look at. Uh, and then more of a separate category on their own is a tropical cyclone. Uh, generally, at the least organized level is a single cell. Uh, then you come up to multi-cells where you have clusters or uh, several pulses of uh, thunderstorms that are all kind of congealed in the same area. Uh, squall lines, which are more organized lines of thunderstorms that are typically associated with damaging winds. Uh, they form neat lines, uh, neat little segments that you can see on radar uh, quite easily. And then of course the supercell, which is characterized uh, by its rotation. Generally, as a thunderstorm becomes more organized, uh, the threat of severe weather uh, will become greater. Generally, with the single cell thunderstorm, uh, the main concern is uh, what's going to happen with the downdraft of that single cell. Uh, sometimes they are capable of producing damaging winds, uh, but whether or not they produce things like large hail or flooding uh, will depend on how fast they're moving, uh, how long they kind of maintain themselves, and for how long, uh, how long that, how strong that updraft is. But as for a tornado, uh, it's going to be a little less likely. As for the multi-cell, uh, generally in these cases, uh, downdraft winds are, are still going to be possible, as well as large hail, flooding. Uh, tornadoes would still be highly dependent, uh, but the reason why uh, you might be more likely to see severe weather is simply because there are more thunderstorms around. Squall lines are going to be organized, and they're going to typically produce straight line wind damages, wind damage. Uh, you can also experience large hail and flooding, uh, depending on the forward motion of that squall line. Uh, and as Matthew uh, kind of uh, indicated in his story, uh, you can also see tornadoes in the right environment with a squall line. The supercell is going to be uh, 
anything that's rotating, uh, it can fit into any of the three categories mentioned uh, as a result. Uh, these are typified by violent downdrafts. Uh, because of their rotation, uh, they're also capable of producing very large hail and flooding, uh, and tornadoes are most likely in a supercell. And generally, their level of organization allows these to also last a little bit longer, which is why they also tend to produce more severe uh, severe events than the regular type of thunderstorm. A tropical cyclone is a very organized set of thunderstorms uh, that as a result of the uh, process of convection and the, di the diabatic heating in it, uh, produce an organized area of low pressure. Uh, typically, these are gonna cause uh, damaging winds and flooding. Uh, Sometimes they can produce tornadoes in the right environment, uh, but due to the warm rain processes of a tropical cyclone, hail is generally unlikely. I do see a question here for uh, the difference between a wall cloud and a shelf cloud, and whether or not those are indicative of tornadic activity. Uh, we will discuss a little bit of detail on what the difference is between a wall cloud and a shelf cloud as we go through uh, each of the type of thunderstorms here. So the single cell is going to be an isolated area of thunderstorms. Oftentimes these will form uh, with the daytime heating uh, and they'll only, they'll just be on their lonesome. Uh, as a result, we sometimes call them popcorn thunderstorms. Uh, typically they're very brief, uh, rarely severe and are driven just by afternoon heating from the sun. Oftentimes uh, these will produce locally heavy rainfall and will have a cluster of lightning strikes associated with them. And you can see this uh, photo of a single cell uh, off in the distance. This was uh, in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Uh, you can see that it's generally far apart from anything else surrounding it. Uh, doesn't really have like a strong anvil top, uh, probably sub-severe in this case. Just to show you each of the different cycles, uh, oftentimes in the morning, you'll start to see some cumulus. Uh, they'll slowly get agitated and become taller and taller until you reach the mature stage. Oftentimes that'll be from when you start to see the anvil of the cloud where it starts to hit the tropopause uh, or any, at any point where the air is no longer rising. And so as it kind of flattens out, uh, it's at a certain point, uh, the thing that's kind of driving that upward motion will collapse. Uh, rainfall, uh, any of that precipitation will kind of start to load uh, and it'll get heavier as time progresses and eventually fall out and result in this downdraft. With a strong enough updraft, uh, these downdrafts still can produce damaging winds. Uh, if you're looking outside uh, for uh, the potential for severe weather with a single cell, uh, the best indicator out of these would be whether or not you see an overshooting top uh, above your anvil cloud. That would indicate that your updraft is vigorous enough uh, to break whatever stable layer is uh, before winds start to decelerate and then start to come down. When you start to look at multi-cells, uh, these are probably gonna be the most common type. This is what you'll uh, generally see most often whenever you're storm spotting. Uh, very common during the summer months and will often kind of merge uh, between several different single cells that'll start to pulse up and pulse down uh, based on the, the different kind of surrounding storms and whether or not they can pull these areas of cooler air uh, and produce things like a gust front. Uh, we have this radar image here uh, near Springfield, Missouri, and if you look just uh, just below the radar, uh, you can see this thin little line. Uh, this would indicate where your gust front is, uh, where you can see areas of debris and bugs that are being kicked up by the gust front as it moves ahead uh, of these thunderstorms. The severe threat for these is also pretty low, uh, but since there are more of them, you're a little bit more likely to see some of your severe threats. Uh, especially if these are slow moving, uh, these will be the ones that are more likely to produce anything from flash flooding. If they're training over the same area or if they're kind of back building over each other as, as opposed to building out ahead of each other. And so when you look at these in the distance, uh, you will see several, uh, several storms kind of popping up together. Uh, you might see one kind of come up and then that other comes down out of ahead of it. Uh, you will see uh, the next one then start to become the uh, parent cell and become uh, taller than the rest, and then you'll see uh, another one out ahead of it or sometimes behind it. And to answer the question of whether or not a uh, gust front is the same thing as an outflow boundary, uh, yes, uh, those are that's the uh, same terminology there.
All right, so now we're going to talk a little bit about squall lines and um, a special type of squall line called a quasi-linear convective system. So a squall line is a group of thunderstorms that are often accompanied by high winds and heavy rains. These are not typically prone to tornadoes, but they can be hundreds of miles long. So um, when you see a squall line like the one on the left, what it's driven by is um, what we call unidirectional shear. Um, typically, the winds and the low levels will, you know, let's say in this, in this case, look like they're going to be from the west, northwest, um, are going to be very similar to your upper level winds, which are also from the west, northwest. So what that does is it propagates the storm in one direction. And as you have a low level jet, um, stronger winds near the surface, we'll be able to see those winds mixed down. And that's why we see widespread um, wind damage and you will see bursts of heavy rain associated with it. But typically flooding isn't, too, um, isn't accompanied by squall lines because they're very fast moving. Um, and you don't really get that training where you get rain over the same area for many hours. So as it moves through pretty quick, you might get a quick half inch, three quarters of an inch of rain, but then it ends pretty quickly, pretty abruptly. On the right, you'll see an example of the quasi-linear convective system. And this is a very specific type of squall line um, that produces both intense winds and short-lived tornadoes. Um, so in this case, instead of seeing winds at the low levels and upper levels being from the same direction, what we're going to be seeing is something called a veering profile. So what we're going to have is, let's say, more southerly winds at the surface, but west to northwest winds aloft. And what this does is this, cause, this creates rotation and this is known as shear. And when you have enough shear present with instability and forcing, these are the ingredients that we start looking for for tornado genesis or the formation of a tornado. So when you have that kind of shear present with um, uh, some kind of strong frontal boundary or mesoscale boundary, that's when we can see what quasi-linear convective systems form. And this is an example of what I experienced when I was in Little Rock that one afternoon um, when this storm came through. Another type of squall line, um, probably the most intense of them all, is called a derecho. Um, and a derecho is um, a, a simply defined as a line of intense, widespread, and fast-moving windstorm. Uh, what you see here on the left is the July 14th, 15th, 1995 um, derecho event, which is known as the Ontario slash Adirondacks derecho. If you look at the timestamp in the top left corner, it starts off at July 14th at 10 p.m. over kind of like the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Well, by the time you get to about 8 a.m. July 15th, which is, what, 10 hours later, it's already into New Hampshire, Western Mass, and into Connecticut. So it basically traveled several hundred, it traveled well over, what, 500, 600 miles in just 10 hours. And the average speed of the ratio is 67 miles per hour. And each one of those plus marks that you see on there is a report of wind damage that was received by the Storm Prediction Center. And this is actually a hand analysis by one of the uh, Storm Prediction Center um, analysts of this event here, with the area in blue highlighting the extent of the duratio. So, um, you know, the duratio typically tend to be long lasting, but they also move very quick. Uh, so we'll see this widespread damage. It's going to typically be over multiple states, um, and it's going to be widespread wind damage. It's not just going to be a report in one report in Michigan, six reports in New York, one report in Vermont. It's going to be a lot of reports. And the thing about these kind of events is they can produce wind damage 80, 90, maybe even 100 miles per hour in, ex in extreme events. So we're seeing EF0 to EF1 wind damage, but on a widespread scale. So these are actually pretty impressive, pretty damaging storms. And you may be wondering, what's the difference between a derecho and like a ball at bow echo or squall line? We're really just looking at the extent of the aerial coverage of the wind damage. So if it's just going to be more isolated, um, smaller scale, it's more likely a bow echo or a squall line. But if you're looking at very widespread uh, damage, um, um, we're just looking at, um, this is we more of a derecho here. And um, I did get a question from Jane here asking, how does a derecho form? Um, Do you really have much on that one? I mean, I guess it, it, a lot of it comes down to uh, having the correct thunderstorm ingredients available. I think derechos are a little different in that uh, the mid-level forcing or the mid-level flow allows these to propagate uh, rapidly downstream. Uh, as you can see, this one uh, traveled all the way from Ontario to Massachusetts uh, in a matter of 10 hours. Uh, very fast moving systems. Uh, just the, the coordination of like things like, uh, we've brought up things like a cold pool with multi-cells, and we brought up things like shear in terms of the squall line. Like everything here is coordinated uh, such 
that these can rapidly move downstream. Uh, that's that's the general gist of uh, how these develop. Typically, you want uh, pretty extreme instability uh, with a lot of thunderstorms. Uh, we'll see uh, pretty modest uh, upward motions, but with derechos, uh, you're more likely to see more extreme stuff, uh, not just near the surface, uh, but also it needs to be elevated. Uh, that way it can continue kind of propagating even during the overnight hours uh, as occurred in this instance here. Yeah, and to continue off what Robert's saying, a lot of these events, um, you'll hear us use this term a lot, it's a jet. You know, you have jets at all different levels, and all we're talking about, all we're referring to is your wind speed. So what you, when we look at forecasting wind speeds with thunderstorms, one of the things we look at is storm motion. A storm moving five miles per hour is going to be less likely to produce wind damage um, just um, than a 70 mile an hour moving storm because it doesn't have that forward momentum. Uh, so the, you're going to have a lot of strong winds at both the low levels and upper levels, which is helping the storm propagate downstream very quickly. Uh, so it's, it's a combination of all of that. And these are pretty rare, and we're going to look at climatology here in just a minute. But before I do that, we got a question from Cynthia asking, where do microbursts fit into all of this? And microbursts can form um, in any type of convective environment, really. You can get single cell, multi-cell, um, even squall lines can have microbursts embedded within them. And all microbursts, when we kind of look at it, is, is a storm collapsing. We're looking at a very small pocket of wind damage or with a strong winds that is descending rapidly through the atmosphere and produces um, isolated wind damage. Um, and that just happens when you have very, what we call um, downdraft cape, or the amount of how, how much energy is, a, is the um, downdraft itself having um, as a storm collapses. And we're looking at that to determine um, the strength. Of, when we're looking at the strength of the downdraft, it lets us know um, how likely these microbursts are to fit. And they, they do fall into two categories known as dry microbursts and wet microbursts. And it all just depends on the uh, profile um, aloft, like we, talk, we heard us talking about the upper air soundings from earlier, you know, when you have melting hail in a uh, storm, we call this precipitate, precipitation loading, which kind of um, loads the storm to um, have the potential for winds. And if that storm collapses correctly, we'll see that core of, um, core of uh, rain or that moisture loaded area collapse quickly to the ground and produce some um, widespread um, or just some, some wind damage in a very small area. So microbursts kind of fit in with all of these types of convective modes. Um, so going back to the ratios real quick, um, this is the climatology done by the Storm Prediction Center. Um, you'll see that it, we average one in the North Country every about every four years. You could say two to four years we average one here, um, with the main hotspot being in Northwest Arkansas, Southern Missouri, uh, where they average about four ratios every three years. Um, so we haven't had one in a while, so you can kind of think, you can kind of say that we're due for one. Um, but, you know, they do happen about once every four years here. And here's a loop from the, um, the event we were talking about, the, uh, the July 14th, 15th event of 1995. This is from the Albany radar, and you'll see the BTB in the top right corner. Um, you saw most of the wind damage occurred south of our area, just southern Vermont. But this is just a loop um, that morning, um, early that morning, um, of that, of the BOAC, of that uh, derecho going through, and there was widespread wind damage. Um, and matter of fact, there was reports of wind gusts up to 90 miles per hour in portions of Western Mass with the storm. So it was a very, very impressive and notable uh, derecho event for the Northeast. So to give an idea of what the uh, what a squall line might look like, um, so we did talk a little bit um, about, um, we had a question about this, the um, shelf clouds or roll clouds. Um, these are very common out ahead of a squall line or any kind of linear structure here. Um, and it's just kind of the leading edge, so like where you're starting to see that gust front begin to move and where you see that cooler air descending, which helps the warmer air ahead of it rise to continue the formation of thunderstorms. And when you see these, you're likely about to have a nice burst of wind because this is the downdraft region of the storm at this point. So we're about to get some, um, some strong winds and you can also get very heavy rainfall because this is just, just ahead of the main storm itself. And if you look at the right, you'll kind of see a diagram of how that forms. You have your cool downdraft. You're, so think of this, you have rain cooled air that's descending. And so cold air sinks because it's more dense, warm air rises because it's less dense. So as you begin to get the, the down the downdraft sinking and the warm air rising, you begin to get a little bit of turbulent eddy. And this begins to form that shelf, that roll cloud that you see. And that warm air inflow propagates back up into the storm and helps the storm continue to strengthen or sustain itself as it continues to move um, whatever direction it's moving. 
Um, and here's an example of a shelf cloud here um, at BTV from this last event on May 29th. And this was taken by one of our forecasters, Connor Lahiff. This was looking west towards the waterfront from the airport. And we noticed this uh, big shelf cloud coming out ahead of this uh, uh, an oppressive storm system, which um, produced um, widespread, well, I won't say widespread wind damage, but some wind damage in the Cambridge area. So to revisit the question from Rick earlier about how do you, um, or sorry, um, from Mark asking what's the difference between a wall cloud and shelf cloud, a shelf cloud is more the leading edge of a um, of a of a linear thunderstorm that's just uh, it's kind of like your um, outflow, your downdraft region interacting with your updraft region, while your wall cloud is actually a rotating mass that is attached to a supercell, which we're going to talk about here in just a minute. So shelf clouds have no um, have no real value when determining whether a storm is tornadic or not. But when you look at a wall cloud, um, that does indicate the potential for a tornado genesis or the formation of tornadoes, um, just because we start seeing a rotation. And that rotation within a storm is very important with producing tornadoes. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and so squall lines aren't just born squall lines all the time. Um, you can see multi fell clusters develop into squall lines over time. And this typically happens, like I said before, when you have these unidirectional shear profiles where everything wants to move in one direction. So during the early afternoon hours, you might get a couple cells develop over the region due to your, your heating processes. And then as things become cold pool dominated with the downdrafts congealing, you start seeing everything form into a squall line and that will propagate eastward across the region. And that's kind of what we see a lot of times here. We'll see some cells early in the afternoon and a conglomerate into a, a line as it moves through the region. Now, everybody's favorite storm, uh, supercells. So these are the most, uh, in the, let's put it this way, in the organization structure, this is the highest in the hierarchy here. Um, they're the highly, most highly organized thunderstorms that feed on a strong updraft that is both tilted and rotating. And this feature is known as a mesocyclone. The reason that this, the reason that the updraft is tilted is it completely separates the updraft and downdraft region, which allows the storm to propagate for a long period of time. You know, if you start having rain-cooled air falling into your warm updraft, it's going to cancel each other out and the storm begins to choke off and die. So having, a, having your updraft, downdraft separated is very important for the longevity of supercells. And a lot of time, your storm tops can exceed 50,000 feet with these kind of storms. Very tall, very easy to see thunderstorms. You see one of these on a radar, you immediately know it's severe, and then you immediately start looking for a tornado. And out of all the types of storms we've talked about today, these are the most likely to produce a tornado. Well. Also, these things can drop the largest tail that we can see, two to four inches in diameter, and even larger. If you live in the northern plains, six, eight inch hail is not out of the question here. So looking at the image on the left, you can see a, a kind of quick diagram of what we're looking at for um, the, the structure of a supercell. Starting on the right side here, you'll notice all these um, high, like these dark reds and these whites. Those are where we see high reflectivities. When we start seeing reflectivities above 60 dBZ, uh, we start seeing, um, that's where we start seeing hail. Um, and so with that region in the uh, northern section of the supercells is typically referred to the hail, hail core. If you find yourself in that part of the supercell, be ready for some large hail. To the north of it, you'll see a V-notch. It's just a uh, very common structure where you just have this little V that forms on the north side of lo lower reflectivities. And then if you look at the very bottom appendage, you have the hook. And that's where your tornado is gonna be if you have one. So going back to Mark again, uh, about the wall cloud. If, if you were to have a wall cloud on the storm, it would be where the tornado or the possible debris ball would be. And that when, you know, so trying to correlate that the uh, wall cloud with the rotation, like if you're a storm spotter and you say, hey, I see a wall cloud here, and we look at radar and we see that kind of feature, we're probably going to warn on it because that's telling me that you're seeing rotation, I'm seeing rotation, it's close to the ground, there's probably going to be a tornado very soon if there isn't already one with that. So that's where you guys come in by giving us reports. If you see a funnel cloud, you see wall clouds, that stuff can be very important to us when trying to um, issue warnings or not. Because sometimes it's tough to tell, especially here in the North Country, um, are we, is that rotation at the lowest levels or are we just seeing it elevated where it's not making it down to the ground? And like I said, these can last 20 to 60 minutes, but can also last much longer um, if it's in a very favorable environment. So um, this is just a picture here of a supercell. Super this is from the Vortex 2 project. Um, you can see, um, if you want to look at the very far left here on the image, it looks like there could be a rotating wall cloud. It's hard to tell without actually seeing it in motion. And um, 
if you look up, you can kind of see these different striations. Like you can see like different layers, almost like a cake. You can kind of pull them apart. And that's just, that's just indicative of the uh, rotation and also the structure of the supercell. And my coworker said, if you look really closely, it's tough to see, depending on how good the color is on your monitor. You can see some bluish and greenish tinges in pylon pike, like in the northern center of the image there. Um, and when you start getting that northern, that greenish bluish hue, it typically is, um, you get, it's typically a negative tail, just via the way that um, light reflects off of ice crystals versus the rain droplets. Um, so uh, this is what, you know, this is, this is what a half a supercell looks like, because, you know, it's kind of cut in half here, but it's a good representation of the organizational structure. And we did get a comment from Rick saying that SCUD can often confuse spotters uh, for wall cloud. That's true. Um, so when we have a very moist and a very unstable air mass, we'll see these clouds, which we call SCUD. Um, they'll try to, um, they'll be ingested into the storm. You'll see them kind of moving upwards towards the uh, supercell, towards the updraft. And basically what happens is warm air, is, is warm moist air is condensing as it gets absorbed, absorbed into the um, supercell. And as it, do, it does that, it begins to condense and it forms a cloud. So people will see these appendages or these lower lying clouds and associate those with tornadoes. But unless you actually see it connected to the storm and making contact with the ground, at that point, it's just good. Um, and someone also said, living in North Calais for 18 years, I have begun to see a pattern thunderstorms tend to get either go either north or south of their location. I wonder if they are following the valleys of the Winooski or the Moyle Rivers. Could you comment um, at some point? That's actually a very good question. So one thing that thunderstorms don't like is they don't like barriers. So when we see a supercell or we see a squall line or anything trying to make it through the Adirondacks, a lot of times we see it fall apart or it struggles to make it across the higher terrain, um, which um, it's, but it's hard for us to see because it's very elevated. Um, our radar scans are really elevated. So we can't always see what's going on at the lowest levels, but the, um, the mountains can break up convection and so can Lake Champlain, like right now it's, 60 degrees so over 70 80 degrees outside it's actually cooler and more stable than we are so um, different topographic features in the north country can impact um, our thunderstorms now i won't say that it could necessarily drive one further north of you or south of you and just put you in a dead zone um, but the terrain does have an impact on both um, the intensity um, and somewhat the location of the thunderstorms like we'll see a lot of um, some of our stronger thunderstorms happen in the st lawrence valley in northern new york on this northeast southwest oriented valley but as you start getting into northern Adirondacks, we don't we don't tend to get those strong of storms um, just because of the mountainous terrain. It's harder for the storms to organize. And so got this. All right. So talking about tropical cyclones, um, I think if we talk about this, everyone um, who's lived here for more than um, a decade or so will tell you Irene, Irene, Irene when they hear tropical cyclones. Is that was a very devastating storm for our region. Um, uh, but tropical cyclones are just concentrated areas of thunderstorm over warm ocean waters that result in falling pressures that in the right environments become organized. So think of a tropical storm, tropical depression, a hurricane. You know, we have just we just entered hurricane season about a week ago. We've already had three named storms this year. Uh, so we've already had a, a quick start to the hurricane season this year. Um, but the good news is it's very unlikely that we get tropical cyclones to impact um, Vermont or the North Country in general, just on our location and the way that um, the westerly winds that propagate over the U.S. tend to take these storms out to sea before they make it this far north. But on occasion, they can skirt in here and produce some um, heavy rainfall and lead to flooding, just like Irene did. So these weaken quickly once they get over land. So they're the strongest over water um, because friction and the lack of warm ocean water create causes that that strong updraft in the center to quickly decay. And we do see very warm rain processes with these. We see small drops, but a lot of small drops. So we get very high rainfall rates. Um, and, and when you start seeing systems moving slowly or sitting over the same area for a long period of time, think of Houston um, back with Harvey, you, get, you can get lots of flooding. And also when these storms begin to make landfall, that increased friction actually creates weak rotation, which can cause isolated tornadic storms that are embedded within the hurricane bands themselves. And these are very difficult to detect on radar. because they're very short-lived, very shallow, very weak tornadoes. Um, but we will, you can see wind damage from these just because the sustained winds are so strong, but you're not gonna see a microburst or some kind of strong um, signature that's gonna produce um, increased wind damage. Typically the winds that you're gonna see with this are just gonna be sustained just from the strong pressure gradient within the storm itself. 
And so just for a quick review, now that we've kind of gone through all of the um, different types of storms, just to go over um, a review of the different components um, of the different threats that you get from each storm here. So for single cells, um, like I said, they're popcorn storms. You kind of get some, you could get some downdraft winds, typically non-damaging. Um, large hail, if the storm gets tall enough and can persist long enough, we can get hail development, but it's, it's a little bit rare with those single cells, but it can happen. Uh, flooding is highly dependent. If you get one cell that sits over the same place for two hours, you could easily flood. But typically if these single cells have any motion, you're probably not gonna get any flooding. And once again, these typically form in unsheared environments are unlikely to produce tornadoes. And we get into the multi-cell and um, squall lines. These are pretty, they, they kind of go um, very similar threats overall. Just, you know, you get some da downdraft winds with the multi-cells, some straight line wind damage with the squall lines. And depending on the convective mode, depending on how favorable the environment is, you could get some large hail and possibly a tornado. Um, but flooding is possible with these multi-cells, um, more so I think than the squall lines, in my opinion, the squall lines tend to be more progressive where multi-cells can kind of just back build and just be over the same area for a long period of time. And then once again, our supercells are most uh, organized structures, are most uh, hazardous ones with the violent downdrafts, which can produce really strong wind damage, a really strong wind gusts, some large hail, some flooding, because they will drop very heavy rainfall very quick and also the most likely storm to produce a tornado. And then again, the tropical cyclones, more so looking at flooding as the biggest threat with those with maybe some tornadoes and maybe just some sustained wind damage with that as well. But so those are the um, storms that we're gonna cover here. So does anyone have any questions or comments as we go into, um, before we head on to some of our climatology for severe weather? All right, nothing heard for the moment, but uh, we probably do need to start speeding up here as we approach our 4.30 uh, time limit here. All right, we will be speeding up here, but uh, we'll quickly go into uh, severe weather climatology. Uh, we are now entering our most active period for uh, severe weather here in the North Country. Uh, July is our most active month, uh, but you'll see even in June, uh, we will start seeing an increase. Uh, you'll notice even that the the ratio of hail to wind reports uh, is or occurrences are slightly higher in May and June, uh, whereas when you get to like July and August, uh, the wind reports will take up a greater percentage. Uh, part of that's due to the uh, uh, part of that's due to how the upper atmosphere is cooler uh, in the springtime. Uh, but as you get towards summer, uh, you have a lot warmer air uh, that lies between you and hail uh, that will melt it before it reaches the surface. And as we uh, kind of separate these out, uh, wind reports, uh, generally, these are going to be most common between 1 p.m. and 10 p.m. And for hail reports, also most common between about 1 and 10 p.m., uh, we strongly depend on diurnal uh, instability that daytime heating allowing that uh, convection to develop and tornado reports will also be most common in uh, in that time period uh, it's very rare it would be a very rare occurrence uh, if we happen to have an overnight tornado here in the north country to show you the highlights of where wind has been most often reported uh, you'll see that in general population centers and interstates will be uh, the greatest cluster uh, generally, that's where the greatest population centers will be, uh, and so you'll see relatively few wind reports reported over areas uh, like the Adirondacks. If you were to go to hail, uh, we have each of the different spheres uh, sized differently towards uh, uh, each of the different hail, like so the larger your sphere is, uh, the larger your hail, and it's also a little bit color-coded uh, so that each gets darker and darker. Uh, generally, the Champlain Valley is going to be the, the focal point uh, for uh, larger hail in this region. Uh, we, it's a little bit more easy for moisture to funnel up into our area and for the Champlain Valley to get a little bit more unstable, whereas kind of as we mentioned, thunderstorms will have a little bit more difficulty traversing the mountainous terrain of the Adirondacks and then areas east of the Greens, uh, but then can tend to blow back up again uh, once they start to reach the Connecticut River Valley. As for tornadoes, here is uh, all of the different occurrences from 1950 to 2016. Uh, not really as much of a correlation here with population centers. 
Uh, part of that uh, might just be how each of the different river valleys are oriented uh, and how uh, kind of that veering from that south wind to the west wind aloft uh, is influenced with the terrain in our area. In general, you'll see that uh, we have not had anything greater than an EF3 here in the North Country. Uh, most will be zeros or ones uh, in this region of the world. Um, and just before we hop into safety here, just a quick, uh, just a quick note. Uh, mainly, this course is focusing on uh, uh, summer convection and summer threats given the current time of year. Uh, we will have future webinars uh, where we will focus on uh, winter weather severe events. Now we've discussed everything from a high level of uh, how we are structured here within NOAA, uh, how we coordinate with the Storm Prediction Center, uh, the general philosophy of how we issue warnings, uh, and have given you some of the information of some of the structures uh, and hazards that you can encounter in each of these uh, different severe events. We want to stress at this time that your safety comes first. Uh, whenever you're reporting these events, never put yourself at risk. Uh, like Matthew earlier, who wanted to collect that hail, never put yourself at risk <laughs> to report severe weather for us. Uh, make sure that you're aware, uh, and if you are going to be kind of participating in storm spotting, uh, have that situational awareness. Uh, understand and have a method of communication. Uh, at least two is always recommended. Have that escape route typically towards an indoor shelter uh, where you can be safe. It's always number one. Uh, nine times out of ten, uh, an indoor structure is going to be the right call uh, for what you, for your severe action, uh, except perhaps in flood waters. Uh, in that instance, uh, you want to be able to avoid uh, rising creeks, and sometimes that might require you to go outside. Uh, but you will have to use your best judgment uh, with whatever is happening outside if there is still severe hail or tornadoes ongoing outside. And lightning safety, uh, when thunder roars, uh, go indoors. Uh, while these aren't specifically tied to uh, severe weather, uh, these are killers. Uh, and generally, if you count five seconds uh, from that uh, crack of lightning or that flash of lightning, uh, if once you hear that thunder, uh, you're about a mile away if you hear it in five seconds. And of course, flash flooding safety. Uh, generally, that's going to be where we see the greatest impacts here in the North Country. Uh, rapid rises can quickly overcome an adult person. It only takes about uh, six inches to knock over an adult. Uh, it takes about a foot of moving water to take away a small vehicle, and SUVs can be carried away by as little as a uh, foot and a half of moving water. Uh, so particularly in the, the North Country where our topography uh, can result in rapid changes, uh, where steep slopes can quickly and efficiently carry this water, uh, flash flooding safety is important. And of course, I have to mention heat safety as we head into the uh, into the heart of summer, uh, especially in our area. Uh, not every building is equipped with AC. Uh, if you do have to head indoors, uh, make sure you have plenty of water, uh, have a method to cool down, uh, so that way you can prevent heat exhaustion or stroke. Uh, if you do start to work outside for extended periods of times, uh, or if you're starting to feel, uh, if you're starting to be excessively sweaty or on the other extreme, no sweat at all. Uh, it's a good time to head indoors and to uh, hydrate. All right, so how to get alerts from us? Uh, there's three easy ways to get it. The number one way is from the NOAA weather radio. Anytime that we issue a warning, a watch, any other product will be issued to the weather radio. Certain ones will tone alert like tornado, severe, blizzard, even winter weather warnings. So um, that's the easiest way. Um, we are now getting sending alerts through the phones through the WIA system. Um, so you've probably seen those. We've seen snow squall, even flash flood products. You will be getting some of those through your phone, but not all of them. So it's not necessarily always the best way to get it. And another good way is through the TV broadcast or your media outlets. You can also report severe weather to us by calling this unlisted number. This is not to be given out. This is for our spotters only. 1-800-863. Uh, or 279. This is going to be your number to call us. If you experience severe weather, see a wall cloud, shell, you know, anything that you find significant enough through from the training you've taken today, this is the number to call us and reach us. 
You can also reach out to us on social media, Facebook, Twitter. We're constantly monitoring this during active weather. We always have a person designated to this. So we can get reports this way as well. And for the one person who asked earlier, do we have a frequency? We do. It's WX1BTV or a 144.510 megahertz. So if you want to report to us for your amateur radio, this is your go-to um, right there. We also have a storm report page at the link provided on here. You can fill out a form letting us know where you are, what you observed, when you observed it, and how much or how strong the event you experienced was. And there's another app you can download on your phone or Google Store, your iPhone or Google Store. What you have here is called MPing. It just tells us it's just a precipitation type. It lets us know what kind of precipitation you're getting. You can put damaging winds, you can put hail, um, and you can even decide, decide, um, give us your size. You can tell us if it's raining, if it's snowing, if it's sleeting, if it's freezing rain. This will let you tell us. And the best thing is it connects to your phone's location. So we'll have a very accurate report to where you're experiencing that type. However, it's not the best for reporting severe weather. If you are going to report severe weather, either by phone, our storm report page, or our social media will be the best way to get it. And if you have photos, those are perfect. A lot of times when we uh, get reports, someone just says 58 mile an hour winds or tree down. It's like, you know, is it a big tree, a small tree? Was it a rotted tree? The photos are very important to us. So if you have a picture, share it with us. We'd love to see it. And in summary, uh, from what we've been talking about, a reliable Skywarn spotter provides ground truth and potentially life-saving information. And the information that you give us allows us to better issue warnings and statements to get out what is actually going on to the public. So your information can help us, can help other people. And um, issuing our severe tornado watches and warnings is a highly collaborative process. And if you guys follow the Storm Prediction Center's page, you will be able to see that process and um, how it's undertaken. And our storms do come in various flavors. The more organized, the more likely for severe weather. Look for wall clouds, shelf clouds, overshooting tops. Um, if you see line echo lines or bow echoes on radar, now you know what you're kind of looking at and what kind of hazards those produce. And remember that our severe weather in North Country is most common in June, July, and August. And we just began July, uh, we just began June. Don't want to jump another month. Uh, so we're just getting into the heart of our severe season. So this is the time we need you guys the most. So if you experience something, you know, we are expecting potential for some severe weather uh, tomorrow and possibly again on Thursday. So if you guys see something, give us a call, send us a photo. Anything you can do will be help. But remember, your safety does come first. Do not put yourself in harm's way to provide us an info. Don't do what I was trying to do, like Robert said. Don't go outside and grab that hail while it's hailing. If you see hail falling and you can see it and you can give an accurate measurement, let us know. If you see down trees or power lines, don't venture out that way where you can potentially get shocked or hit or hurt or trip or hurt yourself. Let us know. Your safety comes first, but if you can safely provide us information, that is a huge help to us. So what, before we can wrap up, what can you report to us and what is valuable? A tornado. If you see a tornado, let us know. Let us know immediately because we need to know that because they're very rare up here and it's hard to see with our, radar, with our radar. And this includes water spouts or fauna floods. If you see something you think looks like an appendage that may be dropping towards the ground, let us know. We can look at our radar, see if that storm's rotating and that could help us potentially issue or not issue a product. If you see um, any damage, like report to us, um, Strong damaging winds, very heavy rainfall, some large hail. These include large trees, tree limbs, power lines, power poles, structural damage. You know, if a tree falls in your house or your siding gets removed, let us know. We also do want to we want to know if there's lightning damage. If a lightning strikes um, a power pole and that knocks out a transformer and causes power outages, that's good to know because that's different than wind damage knocking out power. But it's good to know lightning damage. Well, we we want to keep a tally on that. Hail. We would like you to specify the size, the location, and the time of occurrence. You know, was it one inch hail? Was it penny sized hail? Was it pea sized hail? Let us know when it happened and where it happened so that we can, uh, we can correlate that with the storm so we have a baseline to go off of. Let us know about heavy rain. If you get an inch or more in a short time, two hours or less, let us know. That's the kind of criteria that we start seeing potential for flooding and ponding. If you see any flooding on a river or stream, which could be due to ice jams or heavy rainfall, let us know. We see heavy snow, if you see significant amounts um, adding up, like, you know, we can get into these banded structures where you get one to two to three inches in an hour. We would love to know that the snowfall rate's increasing so we can keep up with that with our messaging. And also um, ice storms or freezing rain. If you see freezing rain, you start seeing accretions on trees, power lines, let us know. So that way we know what's going on out there. Um, so uh, we'd like to thank you for your attendance today. Um, that was, this is me, Matthew Clay. Um, your weather team lead here and Robert Haynes. Um, we do have a couple questions here that came in. Uh, let's see. Um, 
is that frequency, someone asked if that frequency was Vermont. As far as I'm concerned, it is. Um, I'm not one of the, we have a couple of um, meteorologists that are trained in the ham radio um, and have their license, their amateur radio license. I'm not one of those people. Um, but um, from what I understand, that is the Vermont one, but um, I'll have to double check with them, Dave. Um, will a copy of these slides be available following the WebEx? Uh, yes, I think I, I should be able to, to send the, the slides uh, out via the, all of the emails for everyone who participated today. I should be able to do that in a follow-up email, and I'll try to get that to you as soon as possible. And if you don't get it for whatever reason, just reach out to Robert or I um, at the email address here, screen capture it, whatever you need to do. Um, if you get, reach out to us, we'll be more than happy to send you a copy. Um, someone asked, is the number 800 or 802? That number is 800, is a 1-800 number, a toll-free number. It actually works both ways. <laughs> it does? Okay. I always dial the 1-800 number if I ever needed to, but um, yeah, so that's the number there that's unlisted. So like I said, please don't share that number. That is mainly for our storm spotters to get in touch with us. That line during severe weather events is just for our spotters. Um, let's see. Someone said, we seem to begin constantly berated by high winds from the west northwest. Any specific reason, or is this something you see a lot in the area, Essex, Cambridge, and Westford area? Um, I feel like we have been a little windier this summer, this spring summer, than we have been in the past. Yeah, we have been looking a little bit into some research into that, and we have found that this, this year we've been seeing a, a higher uh, frequency of like 25 mile per hour winds than the average year. Uh, so we have been a little gustier this year than normal. Uh, it's something we are looking into. Uh, oftentimes, wind is going to be more of a fall and springtime hazard. Uh, those are uh, typically associated with like the thermal gradients are really important, like having that uh, cool air, uh, especially between seasons, uh, between like the North Pole and the tropics, uh, is going to be something that uh, aids in windy conditions, whereas in the summer, uh, your 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 temperature gradients, like we're going to be just about as warm as uh, the southeast, give or take a few degrees. As a result, it's a little bit harder to get those winds uh, roaring. Uh, oftentimes on the west side of the Green Mountains, uh, if you get a southeast wind especially, uh, you're going to uh, see some downslope winds. Uh, depending on whether or not the atmosphere is stable or unstable, uh, it will determine whether or not it can efficiently mix down. Uh, if it's unstable, it can accelerate actually uh, as the winds descend off of the Green Mountains. Uh, but if it's stable, uh, it'll kind of prevent those winds from speeding up as they uh, come down the mountain slopes. All right, guys, I think that about does it for our talk. Like I said, our contact information is on there. Um, if you have any questions about um, severe weather, spotting, feel free to reach out to Robert or I. We'd be more than happy to talk to you. Um, and if you experience any severe weather this summer, please let us know. All the information is there provided, and we'll have a copy of these slides to you as soon as we can. And if you don't get them, just let us know. Yeah, thanks so much for your attendance. It was uh, great to have everyone on the line, and thanks for all of your questions. Oh, they were great. Yeah, very nice having a very interactive session with you guys. Appreciate it. So have a great day, everyone. Thanks for your time. Thanks.